This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Aaron Decker. Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. Part the First at Mary Green. Chapter Two. Slender as was Jude Folly's frame, he bore the two brimming house buckets of water to the cottage without resting. Over the door was a little rectangular piece of blue board, on which was painted in yellow letters, Drusilla Folly, Baker. Within the little lead panes of the window, this being one of the few old houses left, were five bottles of sweets and three buns on a plate of the willow pattern. While emptying the buckets at the back of the house, he could hear an animated conversation in progress within doors between his great aunt, the Drusilla of the signboard, and some other villagers. Having seen the schoolmaster depart, they were summing up particulars of the event and indulging in predictions of his future. "'And who's he?' asked one, comparatively a stranger, when the boy entered. "'Well, you mid ask it, Mrs. Williams. He's my great-nephew. Come since you was last this way.' The old inhabitant who answered was a tall, gaunt woman, who spoke tragically on the most trivial subject, and gave a phrase of her conversation to each auditor in turn. "'He come from Melstock, down in South Wessex, about a year ago. Worse luck for in Belinda, turning to the right, where his father was living, and was took with the shakings for death, and died in two days, as you know, Caroline, turning to the left. It would have been a blessing if God Almighty had took thee too with thy mother and father, poor useless boy. But I've got him here to stay with me till I can see what's to be done with him, though I am obliged to let him earn any penny he can. Just now he's a scaring of birds for Father Troutum. He keeps him out of mischie. Why do you turn away, Jude? she continued, as the boy, feeling the impact of their glances like slaps upon his face, moved aside. The local washerwoman replied that it was perhaps a very good plan of Miss or Mrs. Follies, as they called her indifferently, to have him with her, to keep me company in your loneliness, fetch water, shut the window shutters o' nights, and help in the bit of baking. Miss Folly doubted it. Why didn't ye get the schoolmaster to take ye to Christminister Witten, and make a scholar o' ye? She continued in frowning pleasantry. I'm sure he couldn't a took the better one. The boy is crazy for books, that he is. It runs in our family, rather. His cousin Sue is just the same, so I've heard. But I have not seen the child for years, though she was born in this place, within these four walls, as it happened. My niece and her husband, after they were married, didn't get a house of their own for some year or more. And then they only had one till— Well, I won't go into that. Jude, my child, don't you ever marry— "'Tisn't for the follies to take that step any more. "'She, their only one, was like a child of my own, Belinda, till the split come. "'Ah, that a little maid should know such changes.' "'Jude, finding the general attention again centering on himself, "'went out to the bakehouse where he ate the cake provided for his breakfast. "'The end of his spare time had now arrived, "'and emerging from the garden by getting over the hedge at the back, "'he pursued in path northward.' till he came to a wide and lonely depression in the general level of the upland, which was sown as a cornfield. This vast concave was the scene of his labors for Mr. Troutham, the farmer, and he descended into the midst of it. The brown surface of the field went right up towards the sky all round, where it was lost by degrees in the midst that shut out the actual verge and accentuated the solitude. The only marks on the uniformity of the scene were a rick of last year's produce standing in the midst of the arable, the rooks that rose as hit his approach, and the path athwart the follow by which he had come, trodden now by he hardly knew whom, though once by many of his own dead family. How ugly it is here, he murmured. The fresh harrow lines seemed to stretch like the channelings in a piece of new corduroy, lending a meanly utilitarian air to the expanse taking away its gradations, and depriving it of all history beyond that of the few recent months, though to every clod and stone 
their really attached associations enough and to spare. Echoes of songs from ancient harvest days, of spoken words, and of sturdy deeds. Every inch of ground had been the site, first or last, of energy, gaiety, horseplay, bickerings, weariness. Groups of gleaners had squatted in the sun on every square yard. Love matches that had populated the adjoining hamlet had been made up there between reaping and carrying. Under the hedge which divided the field from a distant plantation, girls had given themselves to lovers who would not turn their heads to look at them by the next harvest. And in that ancient cornfield, many a man had made love promises to a woman at whose voice he had trembled by the next seed time after fulfilling them in the church adjoining. But this neither Jude nor the rooks around him considered. For them it was a lonely place, possessing, in the one view, only the quality of a work ground, and in the other, that of a granary good to feed in. The boy stood under the rick before mentioned, and every few seconds used his clacker or rattle briskly. At each clack the rooks left off pecking, and rose, and went away on their leisurely wings, burnished like tassets of mail, afterwards wheeling back and regarding him warily, and descending to feed at a more respectful distance. He sounded the clacker till his arm ached, and at length his heart grew sympathetic with the bird's thwarted desires. They seemed, like himself, to be living in a world which did not want them. Why should he frighten them away? They took upon more and more the aspect of gentle friends and pensioners, the only friends he could claim as being in the least degree interested in him, for his aunt had often told him that she was not. He ceased his rattling, and they alighted anew. Poor little dears, said Jude aloud. You shall have some dinner, you shall. There is enough for us all. Farmer Troutum can afford to let you have some. Eat then, my dear little birdies, and make a good meal. They stayed and ate inky spots on the nut-brown soil, and Jude enjoyed their appetite. A magic thread of fellow feeling united his own life with theirs. Puny and sorry as those lives were, they much resembled his own. His clacker he had by this time thrown away from him, as being a mean and sordid instrument, offensive both to the birds and to himself as their friend. All at once he became conscious of a smart blow upon his buttocks, followed by a loud clack which announced to his surprised senses that the clacker had been the instrument of offense used. The birds and Jude started up simultaneously, and the dazed eyes of the latter beheld the farmer in person, the great Troutham himself his face glaring down upon jude's cowering frame the clacker swinging in his hand so it's eat my dear birdies is it young man eat dear birdies indeed i'll tickle your breeches and see if you say eat dear birdies again in a hurry and you've been idling at the schoolmaster's too instead of coming here han't ye eh that's how you earn your sixpence a day for keeping the rooks off my corn whilst saluting jude's ears with this impassioned rhetoric Troutum had seized his left hand with his own left, and swinging his slim frame round him at arm's length, again struck Jude on the hind parts with the flat side of Jude's own rattle, till the field echoed with the blows, which were delivered once or twice at each revolution. "'Doney, sir! Please, Doney!' cried the whirling child, as helpless under the centrifugal tendency of his person as a hooked fish swinging to land and beholding the hill, the rick, the plantation, the path, and the rooks going round and round him in amazing circular race. I, I, sir, only meant that there was a good crop in the ground. I saw him sow it, and the rooks could have a little bit for dinner, and, and you wouldn't miss it, sir, and Mr. Phillotson said I was to be kind to him. Oh, oh, oh! This truthful explanation seemed to exasperate the farmer even more than if Jude had stoutly denied saying anything at all and he still smacked the whirling urchin, the clacks of the instrument continuing to resound all across the field and as far as the ears of distant workers, who gathered thereupon that Jude was pursuing his business of clacking with great assiduity. And echoing from the brand-new church tower just behind the mist, towards the building of which structure the farmer had largely subscribed to testify his love for God and man. Presently Troutham grew tired of his punitive task, and depositing the quivering boy on his legs, took a sixpence from his pocket and gave it him in payment for his day's work, telling him to go home and never let him see him in one of those fields again. 
Jude leaped out of an arm's reach and walked along the trackway weeping, not from the pain, though that was keen enough, not from the perception of the flaw in the terrestrial scheme, by which what was good for God's birds was bad for God's gardener, but with the awful sense that he had wholly disgraced himself before he had been a year in the parish, and hence might be a burden to his great-aunt for life. With this shadow on his mind he did not care to show himself in the village, and went homeward by a roundabout track behind a high hedge and across a pasture. Here he beheld scores of coupled earthworms lying half their length on the surface on the damp ground, as they always did in such weather at that time of the year. It was impossible to advance in regular steps without crushing some of them at each tread. Though Farmer Troutham had just hurt him, he was a boy who could not himself bear to hurt anything. He had never brought home a nest of young birds without lying awake in misery half the night after, and often reinstating them and the nest in their original place the next morning. He could scarcely bear to see trees cut down or lopped, from a fancy that it hurt them, and late pruning, when the sap was up and the tree bled profusely, had been a positive grief to him in his infancy. This weakness of character, as it may be called, suggested that he was the sort of man who was born to ache a good deal before the fall of the curtain upon his unnecessary life should signify that all was well with him again. He carefully picked his way on tiptoe among the earthworms, without killing a single one. On entering the cottage, he found his aunt selling a penny loaf to a little girl, and when the customer was gone, she said, Well, how do you come to be back here in the middle of the morning like this? I'm turned away. What? Mr. Troutham have turned me away, because I let the rooks have a few peckings of corn, and there's my wages, the last I shall ever have. He threw the sixpence tragically on the table. Ah, said his aunt, suspending her breath, and she opened upon him a lecture on how she would now have him all the spring upon her hands doing nothing. If you can't skeer birds, what can you do? There, don't you look so deedy. Farmer Troutham is not so much better than myself, come to that. But tis as Job said, Now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. His father was my father's journeyman, anyhow, and I must have been a fool to let he go to work for him, which I shouldn't have done, but to keep he out of mischief. More angry with Jude for demeaning her by coming there than for a dereliction of duty, she rated him primarily from that point of view, and only secondarily from a moral one. Not that you should have let the birds eat what Farmer Troutham planted. Of course you was wrong in that, Jude. Jude, why didn't you go off with that schoolmaster of thine to Christ minister or somewhere? But oh no, poor ornery child, there never was any sprawl on thy side of the family, and never will be. Where is this beautiful city, aunt? This place where Mr. Phillotson has gone to? asked the boy after meditating in silence. Lord, you ought to know where the city of Christ minister is. Near a score of miles from here. It is a place much too good for you ever to have much to do with, poor boy, I'm a-thinkin'. And will Mr. Phillotson always be there? How can I tell? Could I go to see him? Lord, no. He didn't grow up here about, or you wouldn't ask such as that. We've never had anything to do with folk in Christ minister, nor folk in Christ minister with we. Jude went out, and feeling more than ever his existence to be an undemanded one, he lay down upon his back on a heap of litter near the pigsty. The fog had by this time become more translucent, and the position of the sun could be seen through it. He pulled his straw hat over his face, and peered through the interstices of the plating at the bright whiteness, vaguely reflecting. Growing up brought responsibilities, he found. Events did not rhyme quite as he had thought. Nature's logic was too horrid for him to care for. That mercy towards one set of creatures was cruelty towards another, sickened his sense of harmony. As you got older, and felt yourself to be at the center of your time, and not at a point in its circumference, as you had felt when you were little, you were seized with a sort of shuddering, he perceived. All around you there seemed to be something glaring, garish, rattling, and the noises and glares hit upon the little cell called your life, and shook it, and warped it. If he could only prevent himself growing up, he did not want to be a man. 
Then, like the natural boy, he forgot his despondency and sprang up. During the remainder of the morning he helped his aunt, and in the afternoon, when there was nothing more to be done, he went into the village. Here he asked a man whereabouts Christ's minister lay. Christ's minister? Oh, well, out there yonder, though I've never been there. Not I. I've never had any business at such a place. The man pointed northeastward, in the very direction where lay that field in which Jude had so disgraced himself. There was something unpleasant about the coincidence for the moment, but the fearsomeness of this fact rather increased his curiosity about the city. The farmer had said he was never to be seen in that field again, yet Christ's minister lay across it, and the path was a public one. So stealing out of the hamlet, he descended into the same hollow which had witnessed his punishment in the morning never swerving an inch from the path, and climbing up the long and tedious ascent on the other side, till the track joined the highway by a little clump of trees. Here the ploughed land ended, and all before him was bleak open down. End of Part 1 Chapter 2